All right, this is going to be a video that several people have kind of asked me to do. Uh, just before Porkfest, uh, another prominent YouTuber made a video uh, basically justifying states and refuting libertarianism uh, by making arguments along the lines of uh, the governments have consent and that taxes are payment for services and that all these arguments that libertarians raise are invalidated by these two these two components. Now, uh, I'm not really interested in doing a debate. I think that's needlessly acrimonious uh, and uh, suddenly the presentation of the debate becomes more important than the content and all that. But uh, I think it is a good a issue to address, although it's one that I've done uh, several times before. It's always good to redo it again and you know every day Every, you know, you should learn a little bit more and have a somewhat better justification than you did in maybe a video two or three years ago. So, uh, a couple people talked about, uh, you know, ha have asked and messages also came up in the comments. Uh, and I only know about that because I was linked in them and I read some of the comments. I didn't post any myself and I thought I would go ahead and uh, do that now. Uh, one one issue that was raised, and I want to just bring this up real quick, which is slightly unrelated, is the idea that the argument that well, within human nature is the obvious capacity to be uh, um, malicious, to uh, manipulate and to take advantage of people, to harm them uh, in your own self-interest, to be aggressive, and that for this reason government is justified. You need somebody who can curtail the um, abuses of others and this is only a valid argument if and when we have a point when the people who are in the government who compose either its elected bureaucracy elected uh, politics its executive head or its uh, bureaucratic um, body uh, don't also fall victim to this same description and unfortunately they most certainly do um, in fact if we're going to have an institution with so much centralized power and authority as a state, uh, and so much, so, so such concentration of physical force, it almost seems logical to not have such an institution if indeed we're worried about um, either a, a manipulative sociopathic segment of the population or more generally um, sociopathic tendencies that may be spread out throughout the entire population. Um, you know, I've had managers and bosses and teachers who I think were sociopathic, who were had a will to power, who had, um, you know, evil evil plots, who would, uh, you know, if they could, take advantage of me or others. But because of their station uh, in life, the amount of damage they could do is relatively minimal, even though it could be profound in certain cases. However, those same people were to become members of the government and not necessarily even high-ranking members, even a beat cop, uh, even a public school teacher, um, but most certainly someone who's, say, a president or a congressman or a senator, then the potential for their abuse would be far greater and the consequences far more dire. And to me, this does not seem like an outlandish hypothetical scenario. This seems like a very accurate description of a decent chunk of the public sector, not necessarily everyone, I won't say that, um, and in the cases where we know that this happens, and there's good reason to believe there are many times that we don't know about when it happens, um, the offenders either get away with it completely or receive remarkably less um, punishment than would happen to other members of society, which um, aside from the fact that that's not very judicious, it's not a, 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 any kind of justice, it also provides very little negative uh, uh, negative incentive uh, that means the, the incentive to actually uh, do bad things is greater in that situation than it is otherwise. Not to say it can't happen in the private sector, and does, it's not to say that everyone in the public sector is going to become this way, but because of the institutional form of the state, as people think it needs to be, I mean, this isn't like a quirk of our state or, or some states or democratic states. For states to do the things that people predicate they must, they would have to have power that would make um, 
individuals acting within it immune to a larger degree than the rest of the population to do things. So I think that's kind of a, a very, very poor argument. And that it wasn't long after that argument was raised that I stopped watching the video, especially in regards to a claim that um, an example of this was the um, bloodbath, quotes used, that occurred in the factories in the um, Gilded Age or the Progressive Era, that people were being slaughtered in the factories and that this is an indication of the necessity of state intervention. Um, aside from the fact that people were choosing to go to these factories and that their other alternatives uh, were oftentimes much worse is completely ignored. Um, usually the basis for re referring to these factories in such objectionable terms is because viewing the conditions from today in our um, tremendous historical myopia. They, don't, they look terrible, but compared to what was otherwise going on at the time, much less so, and that's the reason many people chose to do them. But what I really found quite, quite amazing about this statement is that the Progressive Era is tended, often thought to have ended with World War I, where there was an actual bloodbath, actual slaughter on the order of millions. Of people, uh, not just dead, but many millions more horribly wounded, both physically and mentally and emotionally, and a property damage. You know, I don't even need to mention that to make this uh, war beyond the pale of anything any private factory ever did in any era or all eras combined, for that matter. But yeah, the property damage alone would be uh, an astronomical crime. Uh, this is clearly a crime of the state. It's very difficult to see how a state action be attributed to the private sector but uh, it was at that point that I stopped watching this particular video because I think um, it lost all credibility from my point of view however uh, there's plenty of interesting arguments um, that I saw in the comments uh, that even though they've been addressed by many others and by me uh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't you know uh, answer my subscribers. I, I don't like to repeat myself repeatedly, but it has been a couple years, and like I said, um, hopefully oh, as time passes, one gets better at doing this. It's a good practice, and there's always new subscribers or people who haven't heard it before, so I'm happy to discuss this now. The idea that taxes are justified because they're a payment for services is problematic for several reasons. Um, one is that you don't get an itemized bill. You don't get to pick and choose what services you do or do not want to pay for. Uh, although there are fees for certain services, um, those are fees, those aren't taxes. And the vast majority of the money that people pay towards the government are not fees, they're taxes. And they're not itemized. You don't get a bill that says, okay, you used X, Y, and Z, you used 25, you know, you, used, you drove on the roads this many miles, you went to school this many days, uh, you use this much public utilities if you're in a place that has public utilities. Uh, well, sometimes you'll get that. Um, you don't get a bill for how many times the police came to rescue you, how many times you were defended from an invasion, and so forth. You were simply given an assessment. And the assessment is based on how much you earn, primarily, or how much you spend. Not how much the government employs services for your benefit. Um, so... To call it this, I think, is very, very problematic. There's other problems. Uh, if you don't receive government services, or there's a reduction in your government services, you are not permitted to reduce your tax burden. Um, this is quite common, actually. A very famous example of this is calling the police to protect you when they fail to do so. If some harm comes to you, um, the courts have said repeatedly, that the state has no obligation to protect any individual person. Uh, now, this is completely not analogous to every other market actor in our society where if they refuse to give you a service, you have every right to not pay. Uh, even if you had agreed to make a payment and they agreed to provide the service, if they don't, you're not liable to pay them. Uh, if the state, and failing to protect you is only one example, Another one would be roads. Um, 
as roads are built or repaired, oftentimes they're closed, and this has a very um, detrimental effect on certain people sometimes. Uh, while I was in college, the city I was, I was in uh, closed many major roads to do uh, construction project, projects. Com construction projects that many alleged, and I'd say quite correctly, were done primarily as a ribbon cutting effect to um, boost the uh, the popularity of, of the mayoral office, and that uh, you know it wasn't necessary, and it certainly could have been done in a way that was less detrimental, say working at night or or during less busy times of the year. But all these businesses were hurt. Some of them went out of business. All of them lost revenue. Uh, people lost their jobs. Now these firms are then not allowed to go to the state and say since road services have been curtailed for us considerably um, we're going to deduct that proportion from our uh, tax bill now as I said earlier there is no um, actual billing you don't get an itemization of what you paid so it would be difficult for them to even do this to come up with a number but they can't do it uh, the only time the state feels obligated by its own rules to provide you with anything is if you are in its custody. If you are in the prison, if you are a prisoner of the state, the state tends to view itself as having an obligation to provide certain things for you, to protect you. If you are in prison and you are harmed from an attack from outside, the courts uh, consider that uh, an abridgment of a contract with the state, apparently, but in any other circumstance, they do not. If they don't provide you with social security, if you if you are attacked, you say, "Oh, Americans aren't attacked." Indeed, Americans were attacked on 9/11. Uh, we pay hundreds of billions or near a trillion dollars now every year on a national defense, including the most expensive air force in the history of the world, um, by a considerable margin. And yet, 19 uh, fairly unsophisticated radical Muslims were able to steal several planes and kill several thousand Americans and do many, many billions of dollars worth of damages. And no one who was wounded, and none of the families of those who were killed, had any, have any right, as far as the government is concerned, to sue them and say, we have been paying taxes for you for our entire lives, as long as they've been paying taxes. Every all every bit of your authority and your right to rule over us is predicated on the claim that you will quote unquote protect us. The whole point that government is an allowable feature of human society is supposedly for the fact that it's going to protect us. And when the time came for you to actually do this, you were completely unable to. You completely failed to fill, fill your side of this contract, which isn't actually a contract. There's no text, there's no terms. But even if there were, it wasn't fulfilled. And none of these people will ever see any kind of restitution or break in their tax burden. And no one in government at that time will suffer even the slightest iota of, uh, of of punishment for any part. I, I don't even just mean criminal as, as tortfeasors, as, as people who uh, fail to live up to their end of the quote-unquote bargain. Um, nothing happens to them. And this isn't, that's not just a, a singular unusual example. This is the case all the time. <sighs> now there's another kind of proof by analogy here that says it's implied, you're giving implied consent and you're, you're you're implied that you're going to pay the bill, and it's similar to when you go into a restaurant. They don't ask up front for you to pay, but you do pay, and people, and somehow this is considered uh, really good evidence that you have to pay for the government. Well, this is proof by analogy, and the analogy is not even a very good one. Um, for one, you make a very volitional act to go to the restaurant. You're not born there. It's not assumed that everywhere you go is owned by the restaurant. It's a very specific plot of land with very definite spatial um, dimensions. Uh, and you go in there and you look at the menu, which normally, although not always, will have prices on it. And you will tell them what you would like, and then they will provide it for you. And if you don't like what they provide, you don't have to pay. You don't have to eat it. 
you can walk out. If you don't like the way that they provided it, you can have them change it. And at the end, they don't tell you to pay whatever random price they come up with. They don't ask you to pay the aggregate price of everything on the menu. They don't ask you to pay anything other than for the items you selected. Um, you don't get to go to the government and say, these are the services I would like to use. You don't get to have a redo, have them do it again if you're unsatisfied with the products they do. They basically place everything together and say, if you do any, like, you have to pay for everything. And so in that sense, it's not analogous at all. Um, there's another element to this. Um, because let's say that you decide you don't want to use any government. Let's say that it's a it's it's somewhat a valid argument that if you use government services, you know that means uh, it would I guess logically maybe you could say you should be able to pay for those services, but it doesn't seem how you can necessarily be thought to have to pay for everything. But look at people who decide not to use government services. Uh, let's say you go off into the woods and you become a subsistence farmer and you don't use any government services. Now, it was asserted in the comments that I saw that, um, you know, you're, you're not forced to use government services. You just choose to. And you're, since you're choosing to use government services, uh, you know, uh, the onus is on you. You're consenting. It's, 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 that, that's the basis of your consent. And I think uh, this is wrong for a couple of reasons. But first, right off the bat, uh, you can't just go and live as a hermit unless the state doesn't know that you're doing it. And it's possible to fall through the cracks. But if they're aware... They won't allow this. It's not that there are no taxes, because there's a tax on land. They won't allow you to go and live in the forest as a subsistence farmer. If they come to you and say, they won't come and say, have you used any government services? Have you used the roads or the schools? Uh, have you called the police any? If you say no, they're not going to walk away. Uh, th this argument would say that in that particular case, which may be rare now, but it does happen, and it was much more common in the past, and also it's actually the genesis of most everything at some point or another, um, the government's not going to say, oh, oh, you don't use any government services, never mind, never mind, uh, go ahead, carry on. Um, they're going to say that you owe them money, you owe them taxes on the land. Um, now, this, of course, argument, and I'll get to this a little bit later, is based on the very spurious claim that the government owns all the land, uh, ultimately something that relies on circular logic. Um, we'll come to that back to that in a second. Um, there are other problems with this. Uh, the government has what's known as eminent domain. Uh, the government can take any asset, any property that it wants. It can pay any price that it wants, including nothing. However, even if it does pay something, that doesn't make it fair or okay or justified. If only one party is deciding what the price is, then it's theft on the pretext of an exchange. That's what we have going on. Um, they have the right to nationalize and to take whatever industry they have. In the case of the United States, this has happened many times. It's happened to the railroads. It's happened to the airlines. It's happened to the phone companies, it's happened to the radio waves and the television waves, uh, it's happened to our income, it's happened to many, many, many things to one degree or another. And this declaration is not akin to any kind of transaction on the market. Uh, it's not something that's agreed to, it's just something that's asserted and if you don't obey you will be punished. And many people think that paying the due is worth more is, is a better choice than facing the potential punishment. That's might makes right, that's not consent for a service. Um, it's simply extortion on the pretext of an exchange, nothing more. Uh, you know, the great problem with political authority is Michael Humer puts out that these same arguments would never be accepted if they were done by anybody who was not a state. Um, so, yeah, it has a tax on land, it will, uh, for, which forces people to gain money. That's the other interesting thing is taxes, uh, property taxes and all taxes for that matter, can't be paid in kind. Um, you can't be a subsistence farmer and pay off the tax man with yams or, or carrots or, or produce. Uh, 
Of course, I think it's very dubious to assume that you would even owe them this, but it's not even an option. Now, they will confiscate these things if they decide that you owe them money and you haven't paid them, but they can't be paid in kind, um, which forces you to have some kind of monetary income. And this can often and almost always is going to lead to you needing to use systems uh, that the government has nationalized. And this is going to provide a, a very convenient in for those who want to say use of government services uh, justifies taxation. Um, you know, it's forcing you to gain, to gain money to pay off the tax man. And it's just asserting that it has a property right over everything. And that's the basis of its claim to saying you can't just be a subsistence farmer. And again, not many people would choose to be subsistence farmers. But that's how everything kind of starts in its genesis at its, at its beginning. All capital begins essentially in that stage. Um, and, you know, people who, who become subsistence farmers, and long, as long as they're not wedded to the idea of primitivism, um, will not stay subsistence farmers for long. They'll build up capital. And the things that they are able to be able to be produced subsequently is, you know, a list that includes essentially everything. So... The problem it also arises that uh, people say, well, let's say you're a subsistence farmer uh, and you're not actually using the roads, but people are bringing you stuff and people are pe people are bringing you supplies or bringing you, say, metals or, or energy or fuel or whatever else. And you're paying them, but since those people are using um, the roads or other government services, uh, you are accumulating an debt, an debt to the state. This is kind of the basis for Obama's claim that you quote unquote didn't build that. That because government services are integrated into the economy, uh, any transactions you make, even if it's a two-party transaction that doesn't involve the government, you actually owe the government. There's a debt that's occurred, and you owe the government for that. Um, this is problematic for a couple reasons. One. Uh, it's unclear if A and B have a, an exchange, how C becomes somebody who's owed. Now, maybe C did other things along the way, but if C paid, or if, 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 if B paid everyone else, and there's no debt that incurs. You know, if I, if I pay a toll on a private road to go to um, a tractor factory and pay them for a tractor, and then to pay the uh, toll road again to deliver the tractor to a farmer, it doesn't make any sense for a fisherman to then appear and say, ah, you owe me as well. There was no debt left with, you know, any of the factors involved, and a third party can't come in and say, ah, you know, there was a debt that was incurred and I get to collect. The other problem is, again, like so many other arguments that justify states, this wouldn't just justify states. Um, everybody in the world, including the people in the state, uh, need to eat to live. And so it could plausibly be claimed if you and I have a transaction or any other two people that the farmers could come and say, none of you could do this were it not for our agricultural output. As a result, there is some uh, unattested societal debt and we are the recipients of this. We have a right to collect this. And it's not just the farmers, it's the teachers, it's the engineers, it's every single part of the division of labor likes and, and this isn't just that uh, such a crazy idea because every every organization that has a, a lobby out there likes to pretend that it's the linchpin of society I mean, we live in a society with the division of labor and every one of them likes to look at it and say the whole web would collapse if it wasn't for us and really many of them very have a very plausible point uh, however and the government is one of them but there's no reason why the government is actually the only one that can be the vessel, the chalice of accumulated societal debt, as opposed to any number of other organizations or individuals. Um, you know, it's it's just, the state exists, hence all kinds, every everything that we can equate with society then falls to the state, and that just, that's a logical leap, that there's no reason to do that. Um, and also, it's very dubious to ascribe debts between two parties who make an exchange and are both satisfied with it a third party, whether they be a state, a farmer, or anybody else, has the right to then um, assert uh, creditor status, or not creditor, uh, you know, lender status. They, they can uh, extract or, or uh, demand payment for 
their involvement, even if it was marginal or not involved at all. So there's that problem, of course. Uh, we fail again to re realize that all the in in infrastructure that states have were developed before states, without states, um, and that they were progressively nationalized. They were also banned. Here's another problem is that the, the government can just say we're not going to allow you to build such set infrastructure. You must use our infrastructure. And then it's very dubious to claim then that you're consenting because you're using their infrastructure. If you attempt to build your own airport, for instance, on your own land, and then connect with someone else who has an airport on their own land, the state will come and say, you cannot do this unless you do it in a way that we approve. It doesn't matter if the planes fly or if they're safe or anything else. Uh, we will prevent this, and you must submit to our will and our authority. And if you don't you know, launch a full-scale rebellion, uh, then you have to you have to submit and that's not consent you know you don't you can give no consent under the barrel of a gun uh, not in the type that lends legitimacy anyway you know um, to, to the person being assented to um, so there's that problem uh, what else okay so there's also this very kind of since you're still in the country, you have def you have assent you have consented. Um, that the idea that s as long as you don't a leave or b launch a successful massive rebellion, that that is consent. Um, again, this standard of consent is not used for any other agent in society. Um, uh, Comcast cannot come and say you have to pay Comcast because you live in this particular neighborhood, uh, or any other vendor, Pizza Hut. Uh, you know, a company that makes windows or uh, provides um, tires for cars or whatever they cannot come and say, since you live here, you must pay this. Um, and if they tried to force you to pay, uh, and you res and in the course of your resistance, you eventually gave up, no one would consider that legitimate. No one would consider that they weren't criminal. No one would say that, oh, that's fine. Uh, you know, he had the chance. He had the choice, and he chose to resist, but he failed. And either he died, or he decided that further resistance was uh, less desirable than um, just paying the highwaymen. Nobody would consider that a, legitim a legitimization of the highwaymen. Nobody. Uh, and yet, that's considered fine for the states. Um, another comment that was made is that we can... A very a surprisingly a very surprising comment was made that um, we can change what the state does at any time. Now, let's not take the, let's not take it too literally and make it up totally absurd and be like, yeah, you can't snap your fingers and change the state. But um, I'm not exactly sure what how anyone could could type this comment. Um, you. You can write a letter to the state at any point that you want, and you can approach a government agent, except for the more powerful ones, which you can't really approach whenever you want. And you can, you know, write something. You can ask. You can say you'd like something to change. You're, you're welcome to go to the DMV and say, hey, I have new ideas. I think things would be better if. Um, you can write to the post office and tell them how you think, blah, blah, blah. You can write to the military and, and, and tell them, hey, you know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, whatever whatever it is unless you think everything that the government is doing is correct and I don't know that there's anyone out here who actually does although many arguments for the state essentially devolve to syllogistically assuming that everything the state says or does is automatically society's manifest will and hence beyond reproach at least by libertarians but as long as that isn't your position there's lots of things that mo most everybody would uh, think the government does wrong although people might not, not agree on how they think it should be done correctly um, and in the sense, yeah, you're perfectly free to, you know, write to them and suggest the changes. And they have zero obligation to even respond. Uh, they have zero obligation to do any of that. Um, so you can do that at any time. Now, I think what's being referred to here is voting. The idea that because there's elections, uh, we can change whatever we want. Now, we can't do that whenever we want. Uh, elections are periodic, and they're whenever the government says, usually two to four years. Um, that's considerably less. Um, that's that's an order of magnitude less 
frequency than pretty much any other. I don't, I don't know of any other commercial arrangements uh, that are so so t long in duration. Um, if I want to cancel my internet, it does not take two years or four years. Uh, if I want to change my insurance, it doesn't take that long. If I want to, uh, you know, change my living arrangement, it doesn't take that long. Uh, in my my home here, uh, I became very very hot. Uh, I became uncomfortable, and I did that from an air conditioner in this morning. It's off right now, so I can make this video. Uh, it did not take. I did not have to wait two years to. Um, take part in an election to change that. I just went to the store and bought one. And if I don't like it, I can take it back. Um, now, I think it's wrong to say that all providers are equally receptive to consumer complaints, but even the most atrocious, unless the government is mandating their use, um, can't force you to pay. And you can say, ultimately, no thanks, and you can walk away. You cannot do this with the government. Um, in the meantime, before the election, which the government, by the way, controls when the election happens, how the votes are counted, who gets the vote, what are the districts, they can gerrymander any way that they like, they can alter the, ele the electorate any way that they see fit. I mean, there's, they have set their own rules, but within those rules, there's essentially, essentially an infinite gradation uh, and finesse that they can apply. You know, so... The United States is not going to draw congressional districts across state lines, but within those state borders, they can grow, draw them any way they see fit. Now, some of the states have put other restrictions on themselves, you know, that they have to be continu continuous or whatever, but they can revoke those restrictions at any point, um, and they usually don't because they don't need to to get the desired results. Uh, they also control how the ballots are counted, where ballots take place. Uh, and the other thing is very dubious to claim that because you get a say, aka a vote, that you have control. This is um, a very subtle but extremely outrageous conflation. It's, it's, it's an equivocation to say because you can vote that you have control. Okay, I was a stockholder in Pepsi. All right, I had a share in Pepsi that my aunt had given me when I was a child. And I could vote in Pepsi's elections, one vote for my one share. Uh, I don't know anyone who could claim that I control Pepsi in any meaningful sense. Any meaningful sense. And yet my control over Pepsi, both as a voter but even more as a consumer, uh, in fact orders of magnitude more as a consumer, is vastly greater than my control over the government. You have no control. The only time that your directives, and if you were in control, you, your directives would essentially be dictates that they had to obey. The only time that your directives have any meaning is A, if a majority of the electorate of the state selects a sense, and B, if the state doesn't just decide to reject your suggestion. Anyway, the other thing is the elections are not a list of all government programs, yay or nay, or write what you would like the government program to be. They are for politicians. Now there are plebis you know, there are times but you where you can um, I forget what the exact term where you can say, hey, we want uh, this particular issue voted on. However, government has already shown repeatedly that it can um, simply ignore these if it wishes. Now it even sets the balance there. It says, oh in order to be on the ballot you need so many signatures and we decide who has a valid signature and who does not and if we find one person on your many hundreds of thousands of signatories that we decide doesn't deserve to be there we won't even entertain this but even if you do all that you spend all the money which they don't have to they can spend your money in the meantime and tax you to, to pay for it um, even if you get it passed and the people vote on it and they vote with a way that agrees with you a, a type of direct democracy essentially the government can ignore, and as they've done with Prop 8 in California, the Supreme Court just said, no, we're overturning this, and this has happened many times. I've referenced the story before. The town that I lived in, Texas, College Station, um, had a vote against the municipality to outlaw red light cameras. They didn't like the, the, uh, this process. It was unpopular, uh, understandably so. Uh, they had a 
um, whatever it's called, they voted, the population voted to get rid of them, the city, the municipal government just said, we have a contract with the company to provide these, so we're going to honor the contract, and they completely ignored it. Um, so, you know, I don't know how many instances this has to happen before you have to stop pretending like the fact that the state allows us to go to a ballot box, some people anyway, at periodic intervals and select two people that they uh, place in front of us uh, should be conflated with control. Elections are a their legitimacy their their legitimacy theater is what they are, um, and even then they fail because most people don't vote. And again, you're not selecting policies. And here's the other thing: uh, the promises of po politicians are completely non-binding. So you can say, "Oh yeah, it's democracy. We can we have control." You know, and, and if we amend the ridiculous claim that we can change it whenever we want to, whenever they decide there's a, a, an election. Um, and a politician says, yes, I'm going to change X, Y, and Z, and so you vote for them because they promise that's what they're going to do. Promises of politicians, as Spitbutter long ago said, are non-binding. They don't have to do anything that they promise. And it's like a cliche, but that's pretty much what they all do. Pr pretty much. They all make promises that they mostly don't keep. It's rare that they'll keep even a single promise or a, a very small percentage of the ones that they make. Now, if their legitimacy is predicated on following the will of the people, um, it's hard to see how this is can be justified against devolving into it's whatever they say is the will of the people. It's a very Rousseauian, Fichtean kind of they're the state, whatever they do, it doesn't matter if they legitimately win elections, if there's actually direct democracy, if they're actually receptive to the whims of the people, it doesn't matter um, if they're how they're making up what they're doing, you know, they don't have to come up with some objective benthamite rubric of how their actions are actually the best for everyone. Just by nature of them being the state, everything they do is legitimate. Everything they do is uh, is acceptable. And I mean, every argument that I've heard would boil down to this. Unfortunately, the the consequentialist result of a system like that is one where the state can do anything to the point that they won't be completely rebelled against. Now, you know, I I think it's wrong to say that we have no effect on government. I think that's an exaggeration, although in terms of voting, I think it approaches zero. You know, as an individual voter, if that's all you do, you have almost zero influence. Now, as an active individual, as a, as a volitional human being, as a homo sapien, uh, as a bag of meat, there's the potential that you could have more influence than that, and in rare cases, you could have quite a bit of influence. Um, there are individuals who have overthrown their governments, or taken them over, or crushed them, uh, or altered them to one degree or another. Uh, recently, I think I've related this before, I've been reading about uh, the communist rule of Russia in the early days after the Civil War, when Lenin and the others began attempting to institute their their ideal form of, of Marxism and part of this strategy was to confiscate as much uh, agricultural material as possible and bring it to the cities both because that was their power base and also because as Marxist they believe that the, the, the proletarians, the, the bourgeoisie in the cities were the people who were going to actually advance to communism and the peasants who produced all that food you know they were two classes behind and since they didn't really support the communists anyway, if millions of them died, that's no big deal. Um, in this process, however, the peasants objected, and despite the fact that they were largely unarmed, resisting with their uh, agricultural implements and whatever other means they had at their disposal, many thousands, and the number cited in the book I read was 8,500, of the grain requisitionists sent out by the state were murdered, and that basically there was perpetual peasant uprising. And... This did not lead to the overthrow of Lenin's government to replace its replacement by something else, something that would presumably have been better since it could hardly have been worse. Um, but it did result in a change in policy. Um, So-called war communism, which is actually just their idea of actual communism, was abandoned, and a so-called new economic policy was instituted, a far more benign, not I don't want to say benign, but less, less suicidal form of market 
Um, you know, markets were re-legalized, the gold standard was actually reinstituted to a degree, private property, private enterprise were all allowed. Now, uh, 20 years later, this just gave Stalin a pretext for eliminating millions of kulaks, but, you know, they had an effect. These people didn't have an effect because they voted in the Soviets or because they were docile members in a system that was set up essentially for them to uh, uh, rubber stamp the decisions of their political elite. They resisted and they produced a result that was better than what otherwise been. That's only one example. It's hardly the best one or the only one. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't say we have no effect on the government. But to say that we have such a, you know, a control uh, is silly. Um, you know, again, it means nothing unless you, unless you get a majority of the electorate. And even then, it doesn't really mean anything because politicians can do whatever they want within the context of political power in terms of legitimate governmental authority they can do whatever they want with your votes uh, in in essence it's it's a mandate from heaven I got the most votes hence whatever I do is the will of the people so many logical leaps in that and yet that's what people predicate their acceptance on so there's that problem now let's see what else I was trying to organize my thoughts about this earlier and I think I've hit most of it yeah so um, it's 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 quite quite erroneous to say, you know, because you, you are given a ballot and many people aren't, and so it kind of becomes a question: Well, why aren't they? Um, oh, so yeah, so you could just say they own everything since the government owns everything. You know, it is it is consent. We're all like tenants on their land. That's why the survivalists can't go out and expect not to pay taxes. That's why they have the right to do eminent domain. That's why they have the right because they own everything. But the ownership claim. It is based on an arbitrary declaration. This is especially true, like in the United States and in, in the Western Hemisphere and places like Australia, where um, the claims of the United States government are predicated on the royal claims and the colonial claims, all of which were simply arbitrary. It was previous property claims, both of the indigenous people and of other settlers, were completely ignored, and it was simply asserted all this lands belong to X. Now. This is relevant because uh, if they're legitimate, then why can't I also just simply claim everything belongs to me? You know, I, I declare the United States to be terrorist nullis and everything's mine. And, you know, the difference is that if I did that and I tried to assert my will, I would probably be murdered. But if I could gather up enough of a following, and perhaps I'd start off with something a little bit more mundane and say I, de I declare ownership of this neighborhood or this single town or whatever else. Uh, if I had enough martial ability or a, a silver tongue or whatever else and I was able to take over through physical violence um, you know that wouldn't make my claim legitimate no one would say oh, that's fine but that's that's the genesis of states you know this, the genesis of property is going to be physical labor uh, the genesis of states is going to be the sword speaking of which here we go yeah, um, <laughs> I wasn't planning on doing that, but when I said sword, it suddenly became relevant. Um, yeah, this right here is the historical genesis of political authority. And although there might be some kind of Darwinian desire to kind of submit to the might makes right kind of ideal, and there's a lot of people who do, like, in sexual situations. There's lots of people who like to be dominated. Um, it has really, really bad consequentialist reactions when we come to the real world. You know, most of you know I have a lot of skepticism about deontology. I'm not saying it doesn't exist or can't exist or that there aren't good systems out there. I have a lot of skepticism just because it's very hard for me to know. Um, that said, there seems to be a certain degree of subsistent, uh, um, subjective consistency in what people like in their ends. People like to see prosperity, like to see people have the ability to do what they choose so long as they don't hurt other people. I think that's something that most people, even non-libertarians, would uh, accept. You know, the really sycophantic people who really want to submit everything to the government, they're actually relatively what rare. Um, now, there's a big argument over what's the best way to do that and of course many people in good faith and good conscience believe that by having this institution which kind of defies characterization it's a both a a monopoly on many services 
uh, but it's also um, uh, an ideological, uh, a, a legal hypocrisy. You know, you have, you have a double standard. Uh, there's sovereign immunity. There's a whole host. Of, it's a monopolist on legislation, but on arbitration. Um, you know, it, it, it is believed by so many people to be the linchpin of society, although it's actually the one thing that might not be a linchpin of society. You know, like, we probably wouldn't, couldn't really be here without farmers, but I think it's a good, very persuasive argument that we could be here without states. And we know that we could be here without states, in fact, because states haven't existed always. Uh, when the power of states wane, we don't see a destruction of property or of life or of chaos. Uh, in fact, so far as we know, there's an inverse relationship, and I don't just don't see why that doesn't logically follow all the way. Um, just to be very simplistic about it, um, but if we look at the institution as people think it needs to be, then the consequences are wholly negative. And there's another problem, you know, this idea that yeah, we're going to have this powerful institution, blah, 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 and it's, imagine all the good things it could do, and I think it's, it's, it's a hypothetical or a theoretical state they're talking about, not a real one, because it assumes that its members and its actions are best described as, um, you know, bettering society, when I think any honest historical analysis of the actions of states, and this is kind of how I gradually became a libertarian, it wasn't because I read Rothbard or fucking Hans from how great these, these people are, you know, I was a hardcore libertarian before I'd read any of these people, before I even knew the word libertarian, and it's because of this. It's because of these books that actually have a strong state bias in them. Um, that when you read about history, it becomes much easier to explain the actions of government, and we could be talking about monarchs, or we could be talking about democratically elected politicians, or bureaucrats, or technocrats. It's as true uh, for Sargon or Rimsin uh, or Caesar Augustus or uh, Kangxi or Qinlong or Geng Chinggis Khan uh, or Queen Victoria or Thomas Jefferson uh, or Bill Clinton uh, or Fidel Castro or Vladimir Lenin or fucking Margaret Thatcher. That what they do, they do because it's in their interests. Uh, now, people sometimes don't define interests broadly enough, and they say, oh, if they're not directly taking money, then they're obviously being uh, selfless. No, people have other things that they desire beyond money. There's Chigas Khan who said the greatest uh, pleasures in life came from <laughs> raping his enemies with women and hearing the lamentations of them. <laughs> so, like, clearly, there's more to life than money, uh, and as Roman Skaskew uh pointed out to me a long time ago, and I think it's completely valid, the thing that people want the most is status, and that's something that government offers. And the more power they have there, the more aggrandizement they have there, the more status they have. And their actions reflect this. And within the Western democracies, because there's become, and I think this is good, an aversion to overt bloodshed, at least domestically, this is not really followed in a foreign way, they realize that the best way to have status is through um, an iron fist and a velvet glove, and they uh, rule that way. But the consequences are atrocious, even in our more civilized Western societies. Um, not just in the actions, you know the. You know, if the ideal is the letting you know peaceful people do what they w do as they wish without harming others, that ideal is, is fallen short of many times every day. To a small degree, with everybody who are inhibited in some small way. To a more dramatic degree, with those who are who are killed or imprisoned for you know things that uh, don't really violate the subjective preference shared by so many people. But even in the cases that aren't overt the opportunity costs are astronomical and the cumulative opportunity costs over years um, can't really be calculated um, you know we could get wild in our speculation and talk about how you know had it not been I would be uh, hello skyping from my uh, my summer vacation home on Mars uh, I'm not saying that's actually what would be the case but just to say that uh, 
when you try and calculate the opportunity cost, they're so tremendous that it's hard not to even imagine that possibility, even if that is perhaps a bit far-fetched. Um, but yeah, uh, that's what I think. Um, you know, uh, the arguments that the state is doing what's best for society, I think, are extremely weak. The arguments that they're altruistic or that they even have the information, that's another problem. How do they know? Let's assume they were altruistic. How would they know where to put the roads and what what amount of risk is acceptable and what amount is not acceptable? And how would they know how much should be spent on defense and rather than whatever else? Uh, there's no indication, there's no argument that they're able to do that. It's just imagine that, well, what if they could? Well, they can't. I mean, so what if unicorns existed? Yeah, that would be wonderful. They don't. So why are we predicating society on them? That's a good question. Why would we predicate society on, on, on things that aren't there? You know, the best allocation of res the, me the best method to allocate resources that has ever been discovered, and it's not a perfect one, but it's the best by far, is a market system. Prices in exchange, arbitrage of the market, uh, with autonomous individual actors with the freedom to associate. And states are predicated on violating all of that, the freedom of association, the prices, the uh, willingness to exchange, the, um, the binary mutual exchange. Uh, they violate all of that, and so they blind themselves from the one tool that could actually allow them to, um, to perform the function people wish that they could. Um, and the only way they can unblind themselves, the only way they can tap into the market is to abolish the aspects that make them states. Um, and that would be fine. I would be, you know, I would love states if they were to do that. But they don't. Um, it doesn't serve their interests, even though that would serve everyone else's interests, at least in the clearest rubric that I can think of. Um, it wouldn't serve their own, and so they don't do that. Um, and unless you're going to take the position that since they're in government, however defined, anything they do is automatically what's best for everyone else. Unless that is your position, there are a few people who will actually admit to that, although there's quite a few more whose arguments uh, de facto lead to that conclusion. Um, you know, I don't think it's justifiable. The, 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 the extraordinary powers uh, that they are asserting uh, need a better justification than a very faulty analogy about a restaurant. So, anyway, I will talk to you all later. I wasn't planning on making a video of this type, uh, but uh, whatever people ask. I don't make everything people ask me today. Oops, in a good mood today. Oh, and, you know, bonus if you got this far. Um, I made some purchases, and I'm showing them off now. Uh, I wish I had these for pork fists, but they just came today. But anyway, if you made it to the end of the video, say something, because you saw these, you'll know. You'll be like, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> I just saw that YouTube's changing the way they rate videos to include retention stats and how long people watch, which should help me, because I don't get a lot of views, but people tend to watch uh, most, you know, I get a lot of people who will watch all the way to the end is pretty good considering that this video is going to be 55 minutes long. Um, the number of minutes that I've had watched on my channel is now well over a million, I think it's actually over a million and a half, which I think, I don't know, I, I like, I'm, I'm flattered, I guess. Um, it's good to know that people appreciate me enough that they can sit through these, and if you do, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's anything else you'd like to know, let me know. Any questions? Uh, I don't feel like I'm ever going to debate anybody. That's just, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not keen on that. It's logistically probably not in, in the cards. I'm going to be leaving for work in less than a week. I just want to relax and enjoy my new air conditioner. Anyway, I'll talk to you all later.